I have a very complicated relationship with mortars, and that stems all the way back to their release in V9.4. And I'm going to be 100% honest, I am biased against them. And to explain why that is, I need to take you back all the way to when I first started playing Squad, which was very shortly before or after, I don't really remember, but just around the release of V9.4. Now the thing you have to understand about Squad back then is that the meta was incredibly different, both from a lack of a general experience from the community and different game mechanics. Radios were worth more tickets, they had a 400 meter radius instead of a 300 meter radius where they couldn't be placed together, it wasn't really considered meta to place fobs inside of objectives, so traditionally you'd end up with one external fob versus another enemy external fob with the objective somewhere in the middle. The spawn rates would decrease as people got closer, but there was no actual proxy, so even when you were on the fob, you needed multiple people to be holding the inside while others worked on either digging the radio or digging the fob itself. Engineers weren't in the game, so there was no easy C4 option. And the community overall was just different in the way they handled the game. More people were coming from Project Reality, where spawn mechanics were very slow and had to be carefully thought out because there were big consequences to losing them. And they weren't something you could generally just shove down the throat of objectives to gain spawn superiority like you can in current versions of the game. All of this combined to make the mid-game in your average AAS match very, very linear and grindy. Like I said, you generally have two external fobs pushing into each other, fighting for control over the center for the objective, and hopefully managing to push the fob beyond so that they could attempt to get that spawn timer to increase and start getting an advantage to go take it down. And rally points only had 9 spawns, so once that spawn was down, unless your SLs were on top of their shit, they weren't going to be consistently maintaining a rally. Now this lack of experience and these mechanics led to a game flow that really relied on individual skill when it came to shooting. There was also no suppression. The AR kits didn't have bipods and couldn't be transformed into laser beams, marksman kits just had ACOGs. GLs were more powerful, and they were considered kind of the powerhouse of the squad, but they didn't really provide any huge tactical advantage unless you were, say, trying to pin some people into a building. There were things like drop shotting and lean spamming in the game that were much more viable back then. And people didn't really think in the same sense that I do today about spawn building and spawn shifting to take down problems at the source. If I wanted to perform a flank, I probably would have spawned at the fob that was under fire and attempted to break wide and get a rally behind it, which in turn would mean I'd be taking multiple people away from the firefight. It had its benefits, but it also had its consequences. Perfectly timed spawn shifts into stealth proxies that would completely annihilate enemies just weren't a thing. Now this was the first problem. The second problem was that V9 squads were handled a bit differently in terms of creation. First of all, there were no locked squads. And second of all, vehicles were still something the community was wrapping their heads around. There wasn't a crewman kit, there usually were not server rules regarding vehicle claims. And so what you'd end up getting traditionally was four nine-man squads and then a leftover squad, pretty much every match. There are some exclusions, some people would try to run recon squads, some people would create squads and people would immediately dislike the SL and leave, sometimes you'd end up with more than five people who wanted to lead, and I would do things like dedicated vehicle squads, which made me a lot of enemies back then since everybody was used to just being able to hop in whatever the hell they wanted in one minute until they blew it up for 24 tickets. But traditionally, you'd end up with the same amount of infantry created for both teams on both sides. And because of the fighting on objectives being so reliant on actually being able to fight your way through enemies, if even one of these squads decided to not be useful and go to the middle of nowhere, you would oftentimes lose a match entirely off of that. The early game in V9 was pretty complicated because of rushing and counter-rushing and deciding where everybody needed to go, but by the time the objective stabilized and we had a defense and an offense, nine people out of the fight was traditionally just a death sentence. Now even though a lot of people were coming from Project Reality at this point in Squad's history, and even though the game was bought by people looking for a more tactical experience, it was generally acknowledged that there was a lot of rushing involved in this game and you generally needed to push into enemy contact, and most people understood that. Most people. Enter problem number three. Hey, SP, hey, you see that technical on the top of the hill? Get inside a fucking indirect firebox. What are you doing? Oh my god, that idiot! He just. You see that guy run into that mortar? Alright, correction. Right. Five degrees. Add. Five zero. Six rounds. Over. Now, I don't want to mock Karma Cut too much. It's kind of beating a dead horse, and I'm definitely outnumbered here. <laughs> 
but obviously I disagree with the style of gameplay, and regardless of what you think about it, you have to acknowledge the fact that this was most people's introduction into Squad as a game at that time period. And if you want to get nuanced and look at what he's actually doing, how often he's supporting objectives, how many lodges he's taking, and actually look at the strategy aspect of it, you can see that he's not really doing as bad as people give him credit for. I definitely don't agree with the tactics, but he's usually at least on relevant objectives and doing his best to support the team, which is more than a lot of people can say. And that is way more than can be said about the people who were inspired by him and went into pub games and took three lodges, went to the corner of the map, and started building their J11 super fobs every round. Oh lord. If they use their attack helicopter. Look down to the south, boys. Look where that hab mark's going. Oh yeah. Hey, can I get a uh, completely G7? Station? Oh yeah. Ooh, There's no. an objective I there. Gotta, we get it to fit mark there. We gotta get those hangers secured. Enemy team might show up there. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> And now you can see how the three problems come together to make mortars an absolute headache in my mind. First off, the fact that you need to push through people and that the numbers game is incredibly important in V9 AAS. Second, the fact that depending on the time period, locked squads either didn't exist or just were not meta and people did not understand the importance of locking specialized squads. And then last of all, the massive number of Karma Cut fanboys who would grab SL, grab three Lodges, take them to some irrelevant hilltop on Kohat, and build a billion HMGs and start, quote, supporting by fire, unquote, that would inevitably lose you games in V9. And when mortars were actually released, they gave those squads the ultimate excuse to continue to do what they were doing. Previously, you could generally yell at them enough that they would eventually either get tired of the teams hating them and stop playing, or learn to realize that what they were doing wasn't effective, but once mortars were in, they would just hold that above your head constantly. I'm a mortar squad. I'm dropping mortars. I'm doing mortars. It's mortars, mortars. It just became the thing I would hear every time I was actively losing a match in V9 due to lack of support. And traditionally, these squads, as mortar squads, were incredibly ineffective, because mortar calcs were rudimentary and not commonly used, people were generally newer who were doing this kind of thing, and they just really didn't understand the capabilities and the limitations of mortars. And even when they were mortaring effectively, you always had to ask the question, are they doing enough benefit for the team to justify the other six to seven people that they don't need over there sitting around shoveling up HESCO wells? But anyway, enough complaining, enough ranting, enough talking about the past. Things are different now. A lot of game modes and maps can be won by fewer infantry if they play a little bit smarter, and you can usually compensate for people who aren't in the area with you. Similarly, it's just a given that a huge number of people in game modes like RAS are going to go off and do their own thing. It's very rare now to see four infantry squads versus four infantry squads on active objectives at the same time, even with the increased player count we now have, especially in RAS when you can play fast pace and move the objectives faster than the enemy can react. The tactics and the pace and the game modes have advanced to a certain point where this is just a given part of gameplay and it's something that I'm constantly compensating for. It's not the one thing that you're going to see that ruins it for everybody else. But enough bitching about bad mortars, let's look at good mortar gameplay. First of all, we're playing Logar Valley, and this is a fantastic map for mortars for a couple of reasons. The first, number one reason is that you still need to be looking at resources that you're taking when you run a mortar squad. If you're playing on Gorodok Ras, say, V1, that's a three lane. There are three Logi trucks, and there are probably four infantry squads. If you go and grab a Logi truck, even if you're just locking your squad at three people to run kind of skeleton crew mortars, you're still taking a third of the team's logistics. If you choose to use a helicopter instead, but you use it off game start, you're now taking one of the fastest two resources to actually get to midpoints. As such, you constantly have to be asking yourself, am I going to be effective enough on a large map like Gorodok with several objectives that have enclosed roofs where I can't even hit halves to justify taking my own Lottie truck? And the answer to that, in my opinion, is... Yeah, yes, if you're playing a pub game where lodges might not necessarily be used as effectively as they can be, but no if you're playing in any kind of coordinated effort where you have multiple SLs who could potentially be making smart decisions by using that lodgy truck. 
Now, you can still run dedicated mortars and get the help of a helicopter after the initial game rush, but then you have to worry about your relevancy. If it's multi-lane, you might not know lane for a while, and once you do, you might not know what objective it's going to land on, and mortars in this game do have an artificially reduced range to shy of 1500 meters, which can be pretty massive on a map like Gorodok or Yiho. You might have to make a new mortar base for every single new objective that pops up, unless you're willing to get a little risky and get a little closer to multiple clusters of objectives and then risk being easily taken out by a single MRAP with a combat engineer. Now once again, the solution to these problems is funneling more resources into the squad. You need a logistics vehicle so you can constantly maintain competitiveness and constantly maintain the pressure on the objectives by building new mortar fobs, or you need more people to act as some kind of defense for your existing and somewhat hotter mortar fob. But the more you bloat your squad, the more of a return you need to be giving everybody else in exchange for what you're doing. And on a lot of the classic large-scale RAS maps, it really just doesn't make any sense, because the HABs can be hidden so easily, and the number of times in which a HAB is exposed and active and people are trying to take it down is oftentimes limited enough that the commander assets alone can handle your job for you. Now you can use mortars against clusters of infantry, but usually people aren't going to cluster up enough for you to be actively taking them out in a reasonable way. Your KD has to be pretty damn big to justify you not actually being in there supporting cap range, so I wouldn't necessarily consider that to be a viable reason to create dedicated mortar squads. The biggest use of a mortar is the ability to take out a hab in the open, which is exactly what you're about to see right now. 1455, fire. Fire. Hey, okay. going down on mortar mark, careful. Can you mortar uh, DC-1 below marks as well? Yeah. Sniffles keep firing at that goose. Switch to this. T2 copy that. Now this is a good demonstration of why this map in particular, Logar, is fantastic for mortars. There are three lodges, and not all of those three lodges are going to be actively building new fobs all of the time like they would on a large scale map. You can get three great ones down off of game start, and then you can work towards a flank, but you don't need all of them running supply all of the time. So I let my clan member use it off game start, and then I stole it for mortars. This is also a fantastic map for mortar fobs, since you can reach the entire map, there's almost no buildings you can actually place HABs inside of, and there's fantastic sight lines on all of the active areas at pretty much any given time from easy to reach places. Okay, Goose, I'm changing you to, uh... Oh, I mortars are stopping on central, switching to enemy mortars. This means that I have not in any way been a detriment to my team in the beginning of this match by setting up my mortars, and it also means I got mortars up incredibly quickly that can reach anywhere on the map on a very fob-focused map with very difficult areas for flanking. There are habs out there that I can pound that I can take care of for my team that they would have had a very difficult time getting around otherwise, and I can do it pretty much immediately off of game start due to my location and due to my sightlines. Uh, hop off. You guys have contact up here, it's gonna push you. One alive right here. Captain, I'm gonna work, make sure that hab is marked accurately. I'll get a guy checking it. Okay. I'm on DC1. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Hammer, he runs a comp team, a very successful comp team, and he was playing on the enemy team last match. I was just doing some helicopter stuff, but it was uh, pretty painful. The KD difference between the teams was over 100, and I didn't really know how many guys he had, but he hopped over for balance, and I was kind of thinking that this match would just be a roll as a result, but it ended up being a little bit closer than I thought. I think he only had about seven guys with him, and the other team was actually doing really well all around for KD, so it was a bit more grindy than I was anticipating, which was good for me because I wanted to try to make the difference with mortars. Hammer went for a rush up the north road and killed a Lodgy early game and discovered that fob, and that is really the benefit of mortars. Now that we have a location on a hab and it's in the open, it's dead. It's as simple as that. He's working to confirm the location a bit more accurately, but by the time he gets there he does confirm it's already to the stakes, we've already taken it out. And we've been able to counter mortar their mortar pit because of his audio and his estimation of where it was. Okay, go ahead and hop back on mortars, we have enough people blocking that now I think. Get you ready for new targets. 
So Logar Valley and Zumari are kind of two have versus two have maps. There's a very traditional setup that happens in the early game in a vast majority of matches where two habs are created, one on the north and one on the south for each team. If you can manage to collapse both of those halves simultaneously, you almost always win the game on both maps, and it's usually my 100% go-to strategy somehow whenever I'm actually playing this map. Traditionally, I'll try to get a rally or potentially a hab on the east side of the map and work backwards and attempt to find them, but in this instance, I'm of course doing mortars. Gotcha. I'll look for other targets now. More city central laws. Okay, I got a truck here. Uh, one of you range for that. Somebody else range for the compound right next. Yeah, it's a hab. Just range for this compound. Lodgy south side of the map. Yeah, I marked Lodgy and Hab. I have eyes on. I'm ordering that Hab now. Both on Hab, yeah. A lot of people ask me how I treat this map, since uh, most of my guys are focused on larger scale ones. And honestly, if you want to do well here, I would just trick yourself into not thinking there's four objectives in the center. Pretend it is one objective and then apply everything I say to capturing objectives in general. You just want to spawn wipe the enemy. And on Logar, I actually used this map as an example when I was talking about how bad buddy rallies were back in the past when I was making that complaint video, because I was talking about how effectively and simply you could win this match by using spawn tactics and by thinking strategically rather than just rushing in and TDMing. Now of course I need people in the center, and most of the team is going to go into the center and fight, but how well they fight and where they choose to fight relative to those four objectives can be compensated for if you're fast enough in eliminating the source of the enemy problem, which is why traditionally on this map I will either techie rush or MRAP rush along a border, and as I said rally behind them and then work on taking out the Habs, or I'll do mortars like this. Now we managed to take out the north one, get it down to stakes, and now we have hammers guys cleaning up that fob up there, and now we're switching fully to the south one. If we can get these two down simultaneously in most matches, that's going to result in an immediate roll and an immediate victory. However, we kind of misjudged this one. They actually do have a third fob on the hill to the east, which we don't know about yet. Uh, Goose, you're switching here. Put it slightly in the courtyard, right here. The sniffles keep firing on yours. Now the reason we just switched to that target is because Butt called out that there's a lot of contact coming in from the direct east. Now this is coming down from the hill, and we don't know that yet, even though it is marked. As you can see, I don't see that mark yet. And I just assume it's probably a rally, because the other halves probably blocked that, so I just uh, mortar it for the sake of helping them push that. Eventually though, they do get up close. We determine it's not a hab, so I switch the mortars back to the south one because nobody's pushing it to clean it up. Pause on east one, that's not accurate. Go ahead and switch back to a uh, sniffing target. Okay. Ow. Starting cap on upper DC. Okay. What do we know about the north two hab marks? Are either of those 100% confirms? I'd push those mortars back up that hill where they have markers right now. They're coming now. Percent. Do you have 100 percent on hand? Can't confirm that hab that you should mortars at. It is. The same. Should that's not. I don't, I don't know if it's 100 percent, but it's definitely a spawn point. Me. There's like three guys, five guys coming up. Is that accurate up there? Yeah, I'm not sure how accurate that marker is, but there's there's definitely context. Uh, there's definitely like some kind of hab or rally. Don't switch to that target. Keep both on either one. I'm looking for exact eyes. I can't see it from my pause. We're not gonna just border the hillside. Just keep on that target. Get ready to switch to smokes when I call it. I'll keep HE going. Sounds good. You do have it down to stakes right now, I'm just making sure they don't rebuild it. So that was a little bit embarrassing because I actually did have eyes on that hab. I don't know if you guys noticed it in the video, but I didn't at the time. But I'll get back up there and see it eventually. But the ammo cost was increased recently for mortars, so I need to do a quick ammo run to make sure my guys can even keep firing, and that's what I'm going to work on right now. A four-man mortar squad is not a bad idea um, if you need to keep constant logistics and you want somebody spotting, but traditionally I just do the logistics myself since on most maps I can't actually spot as well as I can on this one. 
And I believe in communicating with the team rather than just having a forward observer, so traditionally I will be doing the logi runs while coordinating the mortars. So to give a recap on this game right now, we just immediately annihilated their north and south fob, and because they were a little bit smarter and they actually managed to get three down, which most teams can't, they are still able to attempt to contest the objectives from the east hill, and that needs to be my next priority. So once I'm back into position, I am in a spot for that. Meanwhile, I still think that eastern mark is a prediction, even though it's actually accurate, so I'm trying to get confirmation. I'm also trying to get somebody to actually push the south hab since I have it down to stakes, but nobody's actually going in there to finish it off, so eventually I have to just keep one more on it firing single shots because they're almost running out of ammo, just to make sure somebody doesn't rebuild it. If any enemies manage to flank the south right now and get to moving towards the hill where I was, they could pretty easily disable our mortars, so I am a bit worried right now that people aren't actually jumping on those spawns. I can keep them unspawnable myself, but I do really want that to not be my primary concern right now, especially when I'm low on ammo like this. While I'm running this ammo though, I would like to talk about running mortars not as a dedicated squad, as a defensive tool, um, while you're actually defending an objective, because you can do essentially what I'm doing here on defense if you have two people who are willing to run the mortars. Once again, consider this entire map to be one centralized objective and you'll kind of see what I mean. There is still a resource sink in the form of two of your defenders who now cannot be maintaining a perimeter or cannot be pushing infantry coming in, but in exchange, if you have good information, for example exactly where a hab is, they can eliminate the entire need to flank and destroy it just by mortaring it. It's a very, very easy way to deal with known threats. However, it does limit your ability to know threats, so to speak, by having people actually pushing that contact, getting eyes on habs, and maintaining a perimeter around your objective. This is why I traditionally build mortars as a reactionary tool. They fit into the 600 build meta in that they are 300 apiece, and you can build them if you're having trouble getting to a hab or you want a quicker solution. I'm going to keep looking for a spawn up there. We got TC1 under control again. Somewhat. You might notice that this entire game I pretty much ignore all of the callouts relevant to the central objectives, because I genuinely don't care about them, I just need to deal with the spawns. And that is not saying anything about the SL who's there, I'm, I'm glad he's communicating it and he absolutely needs to be there influencing the objectives for this to work, but it's not my job at the moment. I know this game is won if I can simultaneously delete three fobs. At this point I call off the mortars to the south fob. Looking for new targets. It's probably completely deleted. Capping central back. They might be coming. Oh, it's right there. I just missed it. Orient on there. Alright, we found their eastern half. They're okay. gonna start mortaring it. It's marked accurately. Both tubes, HE, let me know when you're ready. I can't believe I missed that the first time around. <laughs> it's like getting a couple trees. Ready. Okay, sniffles three, then goose three. Right, back to back. Make sure they're on target. Go ahead, Goose. Sniffles, you're good. Fire for effect. Goose, you're short. It's yeah, you the left. Gotcha. No, infantry's going straight north up here. They'll get eyes on you. Gotcha. Oh, dude, they're coming over that. They're coming over that hill. Half the hill to the east, like a bunch of fucking Brussels sprouts. It's an easy. Yeah, we're dropping mortars right on the half now. Should be done. Soon. Yeah, yeah. Just keep, just keep fucking, dude. Just keep fucking like spreading that shit too. You know, the 
fuck is that? They're all over there. They get a ton of kills if you spread. I would have, I would, Captain, I'd probably have one tube to sit the half and the other tube just kind of wrap around in the general area. You'll probably get a ton of kills. Well done. Sniffles are goose spread to uh, that mark. And then just spread by left. You can keep your elevation. Okay. Just deviate right, left, 10 degrees or so. I'll give you a. Uh... Yeah, they're there. Trying to get. Sniffles hold off for a sec, it's at stake, so I'm gonna let them start to rebuild it. Let them think they have a little hope, then put some more down. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the other team, those are some good fucking mortars. <laughs> Captain. This <laughs> weird mortars off. Pretty ugly. Maybe more iconic yeah. duo. Here's what I will say. Cora and more. Consider this match to just be another testament to the importance of spawns, spawn networks, and spawn deletion. We got three spawns up, the enemy got three spawns up. Who would have won the match? Who's to say? It could have gone back and forth for an hour and a half. But if you can simultaneously delete all of their spawns, whether it's through mortars, um, stealth proxies, flanking fobs, whatever it takes, you're almost 100% likely to win the match as long as the people in the center are at least present and doing not completely 100% awfully. Even if they're doing bad, even if they're losing ground, which they weren't in this particular example, and we honestly probably would have won the game regardless. But even if you have a really, really, really bad presence in the center of the map, as long as you can achieve a complete spawn wipe, you're going to take the center and you're most likely going to win the game as a result.